This talk today will provide an overview and an introduction to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which I'll also refer to as EDCs. There are three main objectives of this short talk. One is to explain what endocrine disrupting chemicals are, to review concerns that might be had by your patients, and also to explain the principles of endocrinology that are used to study and understand EDCs. Endocrine disrupting chemicals have been studied and have been really defined by a lot of different organizations, including regulatory agencies and public health protective groups. The Endocrine Society and scientists associated with it have come up with the simplest definition that these are exogenous chemicals or chemical mixtures that interfere in some way with hormone action. And hormone action, of course, doesn't just include circulating hormone levels or the binding of hormones to the receptors, but also includes the synthesis of hormones, secretion of hormones from one cell, and the transport of those hormones in blood to other cells or tissues. Of course, the binding of hormones to the receptors, the downstream action that occurs after a receptor is bound, and the metabolism and elimination of hormones from the body. There are many different suspected endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are often found in the following categories and human exposures occur often from unsuspecting sources like food and food packaging, personal care products, things that are sprayed to keep our homes clean or our yards looking good, and also industrial chemicals that are released into the environment. So we are exposed to these chemicals as humans, both orally from food, dust, water, as well as dermally, things that we place on our skin, and they enter our bodies through medical equipment. Daily exposures to many of these chemicals are often low and typically are unsuspected by people who are using products without realizing that they're being exposed to compounds. These are five different examples and the kinds of sources where we might be exposed to these suspected endocrine disrupting chemicals. So we often hear as research scientists that we've all been exposed to these endocrine disruptors and we're all fine. And we should understand that in fact, humans are not fine. The rates of a lot of diseases and other um, trends of concern are increasing in human populations over time. Things like the age at which young girls enter menarche has declined over time. Sperm count has declined globally over time. Rates of cancers, including testicular cancer and breast cancer, have climbed over time. We're seeing increase in the incidence of autism and ADHD and other uh, neurological conditions. We see increases in obesity not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. And while type two diabetes is often considered a disease of um, lifestyle, we're also seeing increases in type one diabetes. While all these disease rates are increasing, it's occurring over a period of time where very little change could be occurring in human genetics. And therefore the environment is implicated. This doesn't mean that endocrine disrupting chemicals are responsible for all of these disease trends but certainly evidence that has come from the laboratory, some of which I will cover today, suggests that endocrine disrupting chemicals could be playing a causal role in some of these concerning disease trends. So we've been working to apply our understanding of endocrinology and our understanding of how hormones act in the body to study and also understand endocrine disrupting chemicals and the effects that these chemicals could have on human populations. First of all, it's important to remember that the endocrine system coordinates the tissues and organs of the body. As a person who teaches adolescents and college age students, I can tell you that the endocrinology that they're often interested in is the endocrinology associated with reproduction. It's the fun stuff for teenagers. But we also know that the endocrine system is important for coordinating the other organs of the system for virtually every action that the body takes. We also know that the endocrine system is important at all stages of life, from conception until death. And one thing that's often underappreciated is the important role of hormones, not just for mother during pregnancy, but also for the coordination of the development of organ systems inside the embryo and the fetus and into the neonatal period as well. I love this quote that comes from Theo Colborn, who is a zoologist and a writer who reminds us that at every stage of life, 
development is under control of hormones. And what this means is that if changes happen during development, they can't be reversed or often are less reversible than changes that occur in an adult. What this also means from the perspective of developmental biology is that the period in which hormones are acting, as well as the period in which endocrine disrupting chemical exposures might occur, will affect different organ systems, depending on what is actually developing during that period of exposure. We also know that hormones act at exceptionally low doses. They're found in low concentrations in our blood and in tissues of our body. These are often referred to as part per billion or part per trillion concentrations. And it's these low doses that are responsible for things like brain development, for making male babies male and female babies female, and also for things as important as the menstrual cycle. We know from studies of endocrine disrupting chemicals like diethylstilbestrol, DES, a pharmaceutical estrogen that was administered to women under the mistaken notion that more estrogen would be helpful in preventing miscarriage, that exposures to DES in early life can contribute to obesity here seen in these mice if exposures are very low. We also know that low level exposures to chemicals like atrazine, which interferes with the enzyme that converts estrogen to testosterone, aromatase, Atrazine can disrupt the sexual development of aquatic animals, including frogs. Here, this is a male, genetically male animal that has developed ovaries inside of its body. It will mate as if it is a female, and it will produce live young that they themselves are infertile. That occurs at very low concentrations, parts per billion. We know that hormones have very specific interactions with their receptors. And what this means is that the receptors are doing the job of that hormone action inside the body. Many endocrine disrupting chemicals that have been identified interfere with the ability of a hormone to actually activate its receptor. In some cases, endocrine disrupting chemicals mimic the actions of hormones like estrogen. In other cases, endocrine disrupting chemicals can block the actions of normal hormones like estrogen or androgens. This also means, because the receptor is the business end of this reaction, that you can change the response of an individual by changing the number of receptors, which some endocrine disruptors can do, but also that you can change the response in the individual by changing the amount of hormone that's present. And many endocrine disruptors can do this as well. Finally, the fifth principle of endocrinology is to remember that the relationship between hormones and the effect that is observed is rarely linear and often non-monotonic. Having too much or too little of a hormone, just like too much or too little of many vitamins and other essential elements, can be toxic or cause health effects. And the graph shown on the right is the relationship between blood testosterone levels and the risk of prostate cancer. Having too little or too much is actually the greatest risk. This is also true for many endocrine disrupting chemicals. Here is showing you a summary of 31 persistent organic pollutants, many of which have endocrine disrupting properties. And the relationship between exposures to these POPs and the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Here you can see that individuals who have the moderate levels of exposure actually have the greatest risk of type 2 diabetes. There are strong cases that can be made that endocrine disrupting chemicals affect human health. We know that even low level exposures can induce adverse health effects. We've used a lot of evidence from animals and that supports causal relationships between endocrine disrupting chemicals and disease. Since in, in humans, we can't often control exposures. We know that many endocrine diseases are increasing in prevalence. And of course, that concerns us from the perspective of basic science, as well as clinical medicine. And we're starting to understand better the mechanisms by which these chemicals can cause harm in humans. There are more educational materials that are available from the Endocrine Society on their website, as well as in scientific statements and in position statements that you can read for more information on this topic.